Welcome, everybody. My name is Sean kazabowski hausen of Victoria University and the University of Toronto. And on behalf of the Centre, I would like to welcome you all to this, the second edition of the Buddhist Literary Festival 2021. I want to thank you to, I want to give thanks to um, the proposer of this amazing festival, the Venerable Professor Bhikkhu Mihita, um, and also our co-sponsors, um, local temples, uh, the uh, Mahadmi, uh, Mahadamika Burmese Temple, the Mahayana Pure Land Temple, uh, Chinese Temple, uh, the Po Hien Vietnamese Temple, and the Toronto Mahavihara Sri Lankan Temple. Uh, the Center for Religion and its Context, uh, through academic and continuing education events, it, we share its distinctive contextual approach to the study of religion in all aspects, theology and belief, historical development, lived experience, and diversity of expressions in the United Church of Canada and, and other Christian contexts, as well as in Muslim, Jewish, and Buddhist, and other religious understandings. And now I'd like to uh, call on um, Kimberly Beek, who will be singing our national anthem. Please join me in singing. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, through patriot love, in all of us command, our don't bras they protect the fair, he'll save for de la croix. Only soir et tout, et pour payer, de plus brillants exploits. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Thank you so much, Kimberly. And like now, I'd like to say the territorial acknowledgement. As we gather today, virtually, we acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates, and the land on which I am personally situated. This area has been a site of human activity for fifteen thousand years. This land is the territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto or Takaranto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. As a settler, I take on the responsibility of learning about historic and current relationships and my desire to engage in building right relationships I am also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. I encourage you, if you like, um, to put into, into the chat, um, type into that uh, the land on which you currently reside and the treaty that's associated with that. And I'd like to once again call upon Kimberly uh, to sing the Buddhist unity song, Roll the Dharma Wheel. And please join uh, join in. Of course, keep your audio on mute uh, so that we enjoy uh, Kimberly's beautiful voice in full. But please do join in. Thank you. I just learned this song last week, and very, very many thanks 
to the venerable Professor Mahita for helping me learn it. Uh, the words are by Bhante Punaji and the music is by Brett Titcombe. And I will actually start with the chorus before reading into the verse that you see in front of you. Okay. Roll along, roll along, roll the Dharma wheel. Let us all Buddhists unite to roll the Dharma wheel. Buddha with his chief disciple, Saraputra great, and all the saints who came thereafter rolled the Dharma wheel. So let's roll the wheel, beat the deathless drum. Let us all Buddhists unite to roll the Dharma wheel. Roll along, roll along, roll the Dharma wheel. Let us all Buddhists unite to roll the Dharma wheel. Ethnic pride and prejudice is what divides Buddhists. Rituals and dogmas to divide Buddhists to sects. True Buddhists give up pride and prejudice. Let us all Buddhists unite to roll the Dharma wheel. Roll along, roll along, roll the Dharma wheel. Let us all Buddhists unite to roll the Dharma wheel. The noble life that Buddha taught is free from greed and hate. If we live this life enlightened, the world will live in peace. So let's roll the Dharma wheel. Beat the deathless drum. Let us all Buddhists unite to roll the Dharma wheel. Roll along, roll along, roll the Dharma wheel. Let us all Buddhists unite to roll the Dharma wheel. Thank you so much, Kimberly. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I would like to now um, uh, pass on the baton over to uh, the interim principal of Emmanuel College, Professor John H. Young. Thank you, Sean. And on behalf of the interim principal of Emmanuel College and on behalf of the college, I want to bring greetings to all of you today. Um, this is a, an important and significant event, and um, I'm glad that the college is able to have this involvement in it as a sponsor, and um, I'm aware of the contribution of Professor Shu to making this happen. Um, here at Emmanuel College, we have three streams, um, a Buddhist stream of study, a Muslim stream of study, and a Christian stream of study. And in the contemporary context, both of Canada and of the wider world, I think it's really important that we have opportunities such as exist here at Emmanuel College for multi-religious um, theological education. Students certainly learn their own traditions, but by being in some classes, the students from other, other faith groups, they both learn about those and deepen their understanding of their own tradition, but also build relationships that when our graduates are out in chaplaincy and other spiritual care settings, they have colleagues they know that they can call upon and also a deeper knowledge of other traditions. So I'm glad for that enterprise. And then for this literary festival, I think it's important for the Buddhist community, but it's also important for the wider population. Those of us from other faith traditions need opportunities such as this one from which we can learn. And of course, we need to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, it's important to support writers and it's important to share and to build understanding. So thank, I wanna thank all of you for your presence. I want to thank Professor Shu in particular for his role in organizing this. And again, my welcome and best wishes to you in this festival. Thank you. Hello. Um... 
I am Henry Xu, um, Xu Wu, the professor in Chinese Buddhist studies at Emmanuel College. On behalf of Emmanuel College, let me extend my welcome to you all uh, in joining us in this event. Um, I would like to call upon um, the, the, um, the venerables from the sponsoring uh, temples to, ex to say a few words of welcoming message. Um, so first of all, uh, may I ask Venerable Bhante Kawita from the Mahadamika Temple um, to um, uh, greet us with his message. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I would like to say thank you very much for Donna Sungana City and all members. Venerable bandits, members of the Sangha, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to extend a warm welcome and my best wishes to all of you. I am greatly honored and glad to be given the opportunity to give a speech at this auspicious conference on Buddhist literary today. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to retired Professor Dodda Suwanda Siri. Now Bandi Mida Suwanda Begu Mida Suwanda Siri for successfully organizing this event. What is in has three different kinds of religious philosophy and practice or yeah. sadhanas. These are priyati sadhana, patipati sadhana, and pativeda sadhana. Out of <clears throat> these three, the priyati sadhana plays the most important role in Buddhism. Without the understanding and knowledge of the Priyadi Sadhana, which consists of the Tibitaka or Tripitaka, the compilation, compilation of teaching of Lord Buddha, it will not be easy to practice Padiveda Sadhana, which seeks the ultimate path of Nirvana. In short, without Priyadi Sadhana, one cannot know Priyadi Sadhana. Likewise, without Priyadi Sadhana, it will not be possible to practice Priyadi Sadhana, which seeks to gain deep understanding and practice the Dharma of the Four Noble Truths. If Priyadi Sadhana disappears, Padipati Sadhana will automatically disappear. If, if Priyadi Sadhana disappears, Priyadi Sadhana will also disappear. Therefore, it is very important to learn and gain proper knowledge of the Buddhist canons or literature. I believe that today's conference on Buddhist literary will help to fulfill this need. Thank you all. Oda Sadhanam Siram Tetadu. Oda Sadhanam Siran Tetadu. Oda Sadhanam Siran Tetadu. May Buddha Sadhana shine like a bright sun. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you very much, uh, Venerable Bhante Kawita. Uh, next, uh, may I invite uh, Venerable uh, Singin from Mahayana Buddhist uh, Pure Land Temple. Uh, to extend his warm welcome to everyone uh, in the event. Uh, Venerable Singyin will be uh, greeting us in Mandarin Chinese, 
And uh, Ms. Chris Ng will translate that into English for us. Thank you, Venerable Sinyi. Uh,首先就是Chris,老师们同学们,大家,下午好。今天呢,音乐书生呢,很高兴有机会和大家一起参加这次呢,Emmanuel,Emmanuel 疫情已经持续两年之久大家生活学习都受到各方面的限制在如此困难的条件下 你们对佛法经济不懈的专精专研学习精神呢，值得我们去学习。真心的欢喜呢，赞叹你们呢，大家真的是功德无量。我希望通过呢，我们这次佛教文化节，能够让我们更深的认识佛法的利益，更好的
The festival was conceived and proposed by Venerable uh, Professor Bhikkhu Mihita. Okay. So let me uh, invite Venerable uh, Professor Bhikkhu Mihita to share with us his uh, proposal's welcoming message and also his introductory talk on Buddha as language and literary entrepreneur. Uh, to give you an introduction of uh, Venerable Professor Bhikkhu Mihita, he received his ordination in 2018. And his lay name, uh, as many of you know, was Suwanda Sugunasiri. He got his PhD degree at the University of Toronto. He has devoted his life to establishing a recognized place for Buddhism in Canada. As early as 1980, he served as the founding coordinator of the Buddhist Federation of Toronto, through which he sought to facilitate the establishment of Buddhism on Canadian soil. He helped organize Toronto's first Vesak celebration in commemoration of the Buddha's birth, uh, his enlightenment, and his parinirvana. And um, he was also heavily engaged in the promotion of interfaith dialogues between Buddhism and other religions, uh, including his proposal of television programming on Buddhism. He is the founder of the Canadian Journal of Buddhist Studies and also the Nananda College of Buddhist Studies. So uh, Venerable Professor Bikram Hita, let me turn this over to you. Um, thank you, Henry for that kind of introduction. And um, thank you, Sean, for all the facilitating and uh, Professor Yang for uh, accommodating our, our request and the committee as well. And um, all the, uh, every, all the, uh, all those who have agreed to participate in it, uh, uh, make presentations. And uh, Kimberly Big, thank you very much for your uh, beautiful voice for the songs. And appreciate, yeah, and uh, and of course, um, uh, the venerable Bantes uh, who kindly agreed to co-sponsor the event, the Mahadama Temple, the uh, Mahayana Temple, and the Fohing and the Toronto Mahavihara. Uh, so uh, now we want to then be, uh, to say that um, we're very happy to be here. Bienvenue à la festival literaire canadien du Siem. Uh, welcome to the second Literary uh, Festival of Canada, the first held in 2017 at the Harbour Front. We hope that you will enjoy the three afternoons we get ready as to get ready for Christmas holidays. Uh, as uh, as uh, Henry, uh, uh, Professor Shu was uh, saying that the first one was, the first was in, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 20, uh, 1981 uh, at the City Hall and at the Federal Square. And so therefore we are actually practicing after about 40 years now. So I'm happy to be able to uh, provide the leadership once again. Now, when we started this pro program, it was actually at the local level. Uh, and uh, however, I'm happy that thanks to COVID actually, we have now gone national as well as uh, global in terms of participation. And I want to thank the pres presenters for the acceptance of my invitation and we look forward to the presentations. Um, third, is in ecumenical happiness that I thank Emmanuel College uh, for hosting it as well as Reverend uh, John Young as principal, uh, as well as of course, without Sean, we, this would not have happened. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> you have know, guided us from the beginning all the way. Thank you very much. Yeah, And of course, um, I thank Chris Ng. Chris Ng is the one who actually directed me to, to uh, Emmanuel College uh, because being in retirement for the last 10, 15, 20 years, uh, I know nothing is happening. So when I suggest that she suggested, she directed me, thank you, Chris. And then, uh, and then thank you, Henry, for, I didn't even know that Henry was a professor at that time. So now thank you very much, uh, Henry, for all that, yeah. Now, of course, as I said, uh, the, um, uh, I also thank um, thank Henry for emceeing as well as uh, Eleanor, uh, the Opasika Pondriere, who will be emceeing tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much. And um, the um, and of course uh, the uh, the uh, for Kimberly again for singing O Canada as well as the Unity song. The Unity song was written by 
Venerable Bhante Punaji at my request for the 1981 celebration. It was uh, sung to the guitar accompaniment of Brent Titcomb. So let us hope that this model is for, for, uh, for the future, that we will achieve the goals as in the published material throughout the future. Uh, so long as we are guided by the morality as the header, uh, we are, what we are going to be engaging this weekend could serve to be liberative uh, as we also come to know each other, learn from each other, widen our horizons as to what Buddhism is and what it means to be a Buddhist. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, thank you all for the participation and uh, uh, I post it on the web and even at the beginning. Thank you very much again. And before I start, then that's my welcome speech. Thank you again, all uh, presenters and participants. Okay. Now let me move on to the, the topic of the uh, my presentation. Uh, Buddha as language, uh, did, am I going too fast? Am I okay now? Okay, good. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> um, Buddhism, um, I'm going to first talk about Buddhism as a uh, as literature. Buddhism is understandably seen as a religion. It is a religion, but it is more. Literature, as will become evident from the session, our session from the festival, is one of them. Our topic is Buddha as some special features under each of them. Uh, what we see them is that at the and at the hands of the Buddha, the two language and literature seem to coalesce. Uh, what we see in the canon, which is called the Tipitaka, is a language and literary entrepreneur. By that I mean language and literature. The, the, the Dhamma, of course, is deep, Gambhira. So here, adapting the language to the, uh, to, and the using, drawing upon literary devices to reach out to them. This was not easy uh, because the, his audience was spread over 200 by 200 uh, miles square, square miles in India. And for that meant that east to west, south, north to south. There was a lot of uh, variety in terms of language, but still Aryan language had uh, many dialects. And uh, so south, there were the Dravidian languages. So the Buddha traversed all that, and therefore it became to be uh, very uh, diverse. Um, with that, with a short overview, then let me just go to uh, talk about uh, the, the uh, Buddha literary entrepreneur. As you know, verses, for example, Dhammapada, uh, also is totally in verse. Of course, there's also dialogue. Now, some books are exclusive in work, uh, verse. For example, in Dhammapada, here's the opening, here's the opening verse. Mano Pubbangama Dhamma, Mano Setta, Mano Maya, Manasache Pasannena, Basativa Karotiva, Tatuanam Sukamanveti, Chaya Anapahini. Of course, you all understood all that, right? <laughs> now, now, what's important is the, you can see, you can miss the alliteration. You have the Dhamma, Mano Maya, and Karotiva. And the last two lines you have Manveti and Apayini, E, E. So the alliteration. Then you have the syllabic structure. Eight syllables in each line. Ma, no, pub, bang, g, ma, dam, ma. This one, and then last line, cha, ya, v, a, na, pa, yi, ni. Again, eight. So all six lines are uh, in a syllabic structure. Of course, Professor Warder captures this in his book called uh, 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 Book on Parliamentary. Now, however, it is not only the sophistication and poetic st structure that we find in the Buddhian language. 
Here's an example of using onomatopoeia sound, sound, word sounds to, to, to introduce it. Varo varanyo varado varo varuttamo dhamma varang adesai. Idam pi buddhe ratanam panetam etena satchena swati hotu. So you have here varo, meaning noble, varanyo, nobly known, varado, nobly given, varaharo, nobly delivered. And so this then is why the Buddha is a gem, ratana. As you know, the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, Atrida, C. James. Uh, so you can see how he has used these words, the, the word, select the word, to bring out in terms of sound so that it can drill into the ear of the listener. This is so much on poetry, and there's so much we can talk about. Then there are the fiction, the birth story, the stories. Now, the number in 550, uh, and it's include both poetry and prose. And here the, I'm quoting here, the story, the story, the, the, you introduce one or two or three characters, some situations, and at the end of it, you bring them together and then make the message. And then say, so and so was such and such, so and so was such that, I was such and such. And the, and the story and ends. And now here the here, here's the, uh, the, what some people uh, scholars say. Venerable, the story sorry. called your jataka is such. Venerable, sorry to interrupt. Um, your bandwidth is low, and I think if it, so, your audio is cutting out. I think if you uh, if you turn off your your video uh, for a bit and just keep your audio on, it might help because your your audio is. I don't know. Maybe I, it's not. Is, is that happening for other people? I think, yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that, Venerable. Try your audio. But then the story called your Jatakas is such that many of them have become modern day children's books. Taking the modern day Jataka mass, it is scarcely an overstatement to say that for all such foolishness, the oddities, the inconsistencies, the many distortions in the idea and in the quest of them, they are collectively the greatest epic in the of the ascent of man. The greatest ballad book on the theme that man, willing the better, becomes the better. And this is Mrs. David's uh, uh, quoting. Now a scholar called Martin Vikram Singha in Sri Lanka, he, in his work called Jataka Stories and the Russian Novel, deals with how the Jatakas have been used by the Russian novelists. He says here, the dissatisfaction with life, which is a malady of the spirit manifested by the Russian novelists themselves in later life, can be seen in some of the characters created by the uh, by many of them. For example, he quotes, having lived the life of a person for 10 years, Tolstoy renounces his family and leaves home to live the life of a sannyasi. End of quote. Then also continuing, of the characters created by Dostoevsky, representing this type, Father Sosima and Aloysia Karamazov, in Karamazov Brothers, and Prince Mishkin in The Idiot approached the character of the Bodhisattva as depicted in the Jataka book. And in my own research of my masters on the single short story, I show how the Jataka stories have provided both the structure as well as the language. Now, so that, that's short fiction, or to short fiction. Now we move on to the novel. Now, would it surprise you that we can even see a model of a novel in the canon? This is in the Mahaparnibbana Sutta. As you know, in a novel, you have the introduction, rising action, climax, and resolution. Rising action of the novel, of course, is in the initial part, where the Buddha 
the, uh, travels around and uh, generally uh, participates in all the activities that he is planning. But then, before reading the climate, we also have it colored the, the whole uh, that uh, there's a color added. About the color, for example, on his Paranibbana bed, he ordered that Channa be given the punishment of what he called a Brahma Danda, a punishment. Brahma Danda means a noble punishment. What is the, uh, why? Because he was the one, Channa was the one who carried him away from the, uh, on horseback, on his renunciation. But because he knew the Buddha, right, from, the, got the Buddha uh, from the beginning, he had become a little arrogant and he had not advanced too far on his path. So then the Buddha said, Brahmadanda means after my passing away, nobody should talk to him. And, and happily, and happily, the, um, he then over time came to, uh, they, they, they came to, uh, and he came to by Arahanthut over time. Now, now when we see then the Buddha asking that Ananda prepare a place for him to lie down, now we are reaching the climax. And then, however, it's still there's another part, there's a conflict. Because after the Buddha passes away, there was a, a conflict about distribution of the uh, relics. And then when Brahman Drona uh, distributes it peacefully, now there going to be a resolution. And then at the end, then at the end of the novel, there's peace again. Uh, that after the distribution. Now, also of course, much dialogue in the Sutta, providing a dramatic uh, element. Of course, it's not that the Buddha set out to write a novel or short fiction or poetry, but simply that uh, he uses, he was flexible in using whatever would allow him to uh, get the message uh, to the masses. Now, one more. Uh, we can also say that the Buddha is the progenitor, as in my article, the progenitor of the embedded story structure. If you know, uh, the Pancha Tantra, for example, the Sanskrit play, the Sanskrit uh, fable, fable story, and Katha Sarit Sagara, they are famous for inter uh, embedded structure. In other words, you begin the story, and then you something else comes in a character, another story. And then before that story ends, another one, another one. So it can go deep, but on the other hand, they can also simply come back. So at the end of it, they come back to the original story. That is the embedded uh, structure. Now, it was by accident I actually discovered this. I was doing a study of the on the uh, Aganya Sutta, uh, where I found that the Buddha was exploring the universe the evolution and the evolution cycle. But the, the Sutta has thirty-two uh, paragraphs. This was on, was only six paragraphs. So you start the story, and then the six paragraphs explain the, the unfolding of the universe, which I analyze in terms of Western science as being compatible. And then you come back to the original story. So and this also and that the embedded structure is also in the another one called Pathika Sutta. So these are then the novel, poetry, short fiction, uh, and, uh, uh, and and and. But we also then have autobiography of the Buddha. Here's in the, in the Arya Pariyasa Sutta, uh, Buddha providing an account of his own uh, uh, striving for awakening. I'm quoting in, Mahan, in the Majjhima Nikaya. Because before my enlightenment, I too, being subject to birth, aging, sickness, death, sorrow, sought what was also subject to birth aging, sickness, death, sorrow. Having understood the danger, I was seeking the unaging and non-sickness, non-death, etc. But it's not only the esoteric topic that he touches on. It's very down to earth. For example, he says, later, while still young, 
a black haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life though my mother and father wished otherwise and wept with tearful faces i shaved off my hair and beard put on the yellow robe and went forth from home to homelessness and of course the story continues so we can see that the canon is a storehouse of literature all fiction you know, of poetry short fiction long fiction uh, drama uh, autobiography and then for that reason uh, i have also another article called buddha introduces literary realism as you know there was a literature in the before the time of the buddha the vedic literature but it was all mythology the buddha introduces realism into the uh, indian literary scene so that then is the contribution and um, uh, the and then so therefore uh, now this may be then this is what ended up a huge inspirational source for the works of disciples the teragatha and the serigatha that about which you'll hear later um, and of course uh, here's what they say what um, uh, uh, scholar says uh, the teragatha and serigatha uh, what is it hinaba quote allow a unique glimpse at very early indian poetry otherwise completely lost these are partly love lyrics love lyrics adapted to religious purposes the form of the stanzas are completely different from anything found in vedic literature if therigatha represents the first surviving poetry composed by women in india the poetically excellent quality of these verses is not matched by indian poetesses of later periods a classification of poets which itself is again unique found in the theravada tradition ca- canon underlies that there were even attempts to build a theory of poetics later later on too uh, of course we saw that this little tradition has inspired contemporary writers in english for example uh, we have the light of asia by said bin arnold then alexander david neil whose teachings and book cover about 30 about 30 books quote influenced the beat writers like jack kerouac and allen ginsberg the popularizer of eastern philosophy allen watts and the satirist uh, benjamin cream then of course there are the modern day buddhist novelists that we will um, encounter you know in, in our uh, festival uh, so we can listen to ajam pundamos uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, tomorrow this then is the buddha as language as, as a literary entrepreneur now to move on to the buddha language entrepreneur again i begin with the quote there from brian levman now at the university of toronto pali is full of idiom of nat- pali is full of natural idioms and colloquial expressions it is the opposite of sanskrit the formal abstract liturgical language of brahmanism it is in its con- in his conversation and directness harmony and musicality oral immediacy and visceral emotivity pali speaks to the here and now by uh, by brian J- lemon now one of the markers of buddha's communication is how he personalizes his language usage he says now monks i teach you what ananda do you think when vachagota did i did you hear me say now pajapati yes a great king and the father the tatagat sariput tatagat sariput knows when best to do so the and of course his um, um calm demeanor uh, puts any uh, makes the listener uh, comfortable uh, in his presence now next there is also the creative creative use of language what he called double entendre double meaning he refers to himself as tathagata which has two meanings tathagata meaning thus gone and tathagata thus come 
that we have gone that experimental route from luxury to suffering in the bush to the middle path and gone out as well the route of liberation or to keep the sense that it comes with deep understanding great skills great compassion great qualities so it's kept in the word tathagata then take the term garudam the the rule led uh, handed down to mahapajapati gotami uh, for her higher ordination upasampada here the term garu in garudam cuts two ways for one it means heavy this is the meaning that most scholars have given but also gives the meaning of uh, respectful garu uh, that being a blessing in the mahamangala sutra and then there the buddha's use of allegory parable metaphor and the like is an example that in the kasi in the kasi bharat the sutra a brahmin farmer was distributing food and buddha goes there and stands by the side seeing him the farmer comes to the buddha and talks to him condescendingly oh recluse i plow and sow having plowed and sowed i eat you also recluse should plow and sow and having plowed and sown you should eat then the buddha immediately says i too brahmin plow and sow and having plowed and sown i eat the brahmin was perplexed we see neither yoke nor plow nor plow share no god no oxen of the venerable gotama and yet you say you plow and sow buddha explains confidence is the seed self control the rain wisdom my yoke and plow modesty is my pole mind the rope mindfulness my plowshare and the god and it continues i make truth the destroyer of weeds and calm my release exertion is my yoked oxen which carries me to nibbana now the the brahmin is impressed and immediately asks for ordination and then attends arahant uh, not very soon uh, not very uh, not very long after now here's another another example you know the word sotapan sotapan is the first stage of the path to liberation sotapanna sakodagami anagami araha by definition sotapan means stream enter so already the person is in the stream that means you only go one way but the buddha makes another metaphor just as a tree standing upright tilting in a given direction falls down in the same direction if cut at the roots just so for sotapanna this effectively made the point how the process of liberation for sotapanna is as natural as that and irreversible and to be noted is that the cutting is at the roots so what the, what's the, the importance was relevance because liberation comes from cutting down the roots and a mula of cupidity aversion and ignorance raga dosa moha so we can see how the buddha uses language effectively basing himself in what is relevant and is understood by the listener uh however it's also more, more than that he's flexible as you know when we pay homage to the buddha in pali we say buddhang saranang gacchami then we say dhammang saranang gacchami sangang saranang gacchami that's how you hear at the temple and in homes but then there was this uh, 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 youth called chatta chatta manavaka now he then recommends that he pay homage in a different way in poetry yo vadatam pavaro manu jesu sakya muni bhagava kata kichu paragato balavirya samangi tam sugatam saranatam upemi so tam sugatam to the well gone one i go for refuge likewise second line in the uh, set of four lines the last line again 
Dhamma imang sarunatam femi. To the very Dhamma, I go for refuge. Then the third one, again, four lines. After th the third, the fourth one say, Sangha imang sarunatam femi. I go for refuge. Because even further, up to that time, the delivery in the, in the Vedas was in a, in a, in a technique called the uh, Gita Sara. Gita, music, singing, Sara, voice, uh, 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 the vowels, and uh, uh, in that type. Now, to explain that, I invite um, I invite um, Kimberly Peak to please give us the the septet, in, as in the Western, or the subtaka, as in the in Indian theory, of the, uh, the seven scale, the seven um, tone scale, um, in, uh, and I will ask uh, as this as in the uh, film voice of uh, sound of music. So, Kimberly, could you please uh, uh, sing it for us? This is a shortened version of the whole song. Do a deer, a female deer. Ray, a drop of golden sun. Me, a name I call myself. Far, a long, long way to run. So, a needle pulling thread. La, a note to follow. So, tea, a drink with jam and bread. That will bring us back to go. Oh, 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 go. Thank you, Kimberly. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So that the septet, and that of course, as you see, it's a way of promotion of emotion. The idea is to entertain the listener, and that would mean that you take it, that is continuation of attachment. That's not something that the Buddha wants uh, because that will be continuity. That no way of liberation. So then he comes with a technique called sarabanya, literally vowel speaking. Now you can notice that the septet by definition has seven, uh, seven levels plus one. But here you see that there's only two, do re or sa re. Here's how it goes. Varo, uh, okay, sorry, before that. This is a technique that you will hear. We have not, most people don't know what this is. I just like an article uh, after 100 years on this. <laughs> and this is a technique used by Theravada monks to chant even today. And here's an example, this sample. I'll use the same example as the early word Varo Varanyu. Varo see that he uses only the two levels, Dore or Sari, and a little trill, a little higher, but nothing beyond. Now, now of course, here, the idea would be bring calm, but make it a little more attractive than simply talking, but nevertheless, not too high. And it is so effective, sometimes too effective. In fact, when the Paritha is chanted all night, as in some temples, some people just sleep on the floor. They fall asleep. It was so calming. So the Buddha uses language and musicality over effective to effective delivery. And now we find so finally come to the language of Pali itself, in, Buddha, in which the Buddha Dhamma was written, originally written in the first century BC, in the in then Tambabana, Pani, modern Sri Lanka.
still trying to fi figure out the origins of part and spoke. That is the view that Buddha Dhamma was only translated into Pali later from whatever language uh, the Buddha was in. That was something that's very different for me to, uh, and, uh, to, to, consider, to consider. So going against the scholarly take, I write a paper called Buddha as Progenitor of Pali, the Non-Parole Lingua Dhammika. This is in Academia uh, EDU or this space. Non-parole, of course, means that you're not used of speaking. And the Dhamma was kept in the hands of a few, beginning with Ananda, the Dhamma treasurer, yes, Ariputta, and other Arahams. Now, when a language comes to be sp spoken, as you know, it naturally begins to change. In terms of individual preference, locale, purpose, which is used, uh, is written academically, creatively, and all that. That's why I say that we are kept in the hands of a few. Because the uh, Buddha's intent, of course, was to keep the Dhamma, Saddhamma, in its pristine purity as long as it can be. So, therefore, I say that the, you, know, you know that the Buddha was without a personal attendant for 20 years. In the 20th year, he goes and looks for an um, attendant. So everybody puts up their hand, including Sariput and Mogallan, everybody. But there's one person who was silent, who did not move, and that was Ananda. Then the Buddha walked over to him and then asked him to be the attendant, which he agrees to. Agrees to. And then I consider that the hiring, the, the getting Ananda as a personal attendant was one of the most important conditions for, for him to introduce Pali. In other words, he had created the Pali, like Panini had created Sanskrit, former Sanskrit from the uh, dialects, because here the, the Buddha uh, uh, identifies the qualities of Ananda. He, and he qualified five preeminent qualities. One is heard much, Bahus Sutta. Second is good memory, Sati Mantra. Third, Gati Mantra, mastery of the sequential structure teachings. And fourth, steadfastness in study, Diti Mantra. And being serving as attendant is only the fifth. So why would the Buddha talk about the four great waves of learning a language and keeping in memory if the most important thing was attendance? So I'm saying that the Buddha was waiting for a, for, a, for, a, for a time. He had developed the language. I'm not talking of which language he spoke in or taught in, but in, in, uh, reserve, in preserving the Dhamma, he created a language called Pali and then hire, uh, had, uh, and had uh, Ananda uh, to uh, be the treasurer. But he says he learned 82,000 teachings from the Buddha and two more, 2,000 more from the other Arahams. So he learned 84,000 language and to be translated by, okay. So then you can see therefore that the Buddha was now a language entrepreneur as well. Uh, we've said how the different techniques and also this uh, language. Uh, so the Buddha can be said to be a language entrepreneur, not only for using language creatively, but also for creating the language of Pali as well. Uh, towards the retention of Dhamma in the pristine uh, uh, purity. Now, the, to close it, to come to the end, while well, this presentation put up in haste is by no means comprehensive, it is hopefully indicative of how the Buddha come to be both an entrepreneur in both language and literature, combined it effectively to deliver the Dhamma. So celebrating literature as at our festival, then, is in the very spirit of the Buddha. It is not a deviation going away from religion. So as long as you are guided by the morality as in the header of the public announcement of this event, what you engage in this weekend could well serve to be the liberative, could, could be liberative as we widen our horizons as to what constitutes Buddhism and what it means to be Buddhist. So thank you all again for listening to me and we hope that the festival introduces us to a dimension related to Buddha Dhamma little known. This is only the beginning. So let's keep watering the seed planted adding good fertilizer and keep watering as the supreme begins to grow. Blessings for the triple gem. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, um, uh, Venerable Professor Mikumita, for sharing with us your insight into the different genres of Buddhist writing in the Pali Canon, uh, and your insight about how the Buddha pers uh, personalized his use of the language, and also how the language could be used as a form of pedagogy. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if uh, you want to take uh, questions from the, uh, the participants? If that time, I will, yes. Yeah. Um, any questions? Anyone? Yes. Yeah. Thank you uh, uh, for this wonderful talk, uh, Venerable. Um, I wanted to clarify a couple of uh, points you made about the, especially this last point intrigued me and uh, you were cutting out, my audio was cutting out a little bit. So I wanted to hear again about how the Buddha created Pali. And I wanted to hear the role that Ananda played in that process, particularly. And, you know, I, I, what resources was the Buddha drawing on as he created this language? And, and what exactly was Ananda's role? Well, okay. The, what he was drawing upon was nothing but the existing language in society, the different dialects. The issue, of course, was going around. It was very difficult to make the, have a language that will, that will, uh, in which the Saddhamma would be retained for posterity if it is in different languages, in, in the different dialects. To, to talk to a person, individual, in a given context, you can use the dialect because one of the skills the Buddha says he has is called Anusasana Patihariya, the miracle of teaching. He's also known as, of course, the, the teacher of both humans and devils. So when, as he travels, there are different people and he makes them understand. However, if you were to use all that, then it's going to be a confusion once he passes away. Nobody knows how to check it out. But if, so therefore we have to have a common language in which everything is written in the same dialect, in the same language. Now, but then of course, how, but he needs somebody to understand and remember in addition to himself. So who would be best qualified? Mind you, Ananda was his cousin. They practically spoke the same language. They spoke the same language. So if there were any difficulties, then the Buddha could even explain that in, the, in whatever language that they spoke. However, the issue was that it had been memorized. Because Buddha says, if somebody uh, said that this is the Buddha's teaching, to check it against attena, atta attena, meaning and meaning, vyanjana, vyanjana, pada, and, and line to line, sound to sound, etc. So then somebody has to know what they were. It was not written, mind you. It is only memory. So we have to have somebody who has an excellent memory. And therefore, uh, that's why he selected Ananda. And being in proximity, as you know, in communication, being in proximity as a proxemics is very important. So because Ananda was there every day, well, one of the conditions that, the Buddha, that Ananda agreed to be his uh, attendant is that when, if there's anything that was taught, in his absence, to please repeat that to him. So let's say he goes to, Buddha goes to uh, north, and then he, but Ananda was not there. And then the next time he goes to east, Ananda was not, but east is a different dialect. So rather than carrying Ananda to his dialect, and he said, okay, stay here, I will go and repeat the same language. And that's why you want to have a lingua franca. But the lingua franca could not be uh, could not be in society because society, by definition, had different dialects. Prakrit, for example, Sanskrit, Dravidian, etc. And that's the role that Ananda played. So his function was to memorize and keep in memory. This is why, for example, when the first council was held, they Ananda was not an arhant as yet. So they were hesitant to have him, include him. Kasa was determined not to. Why? Because not being an arahant means there could be a, a lapse of memory. Because there can be some kind of weakness in you that interferes. But if you're an arahant, then you have it perfect. Which is why Ananda tried and tried and tried. And then only the night before, 
after being into meditation, still he had not become an arahant, he was about to lie down. And up to that time, he had, a, he had a, an attachment to be uh, at a Nibbana, but that's it is an attachment. So then after meditation, he was about to go to take a nap and then as his leg was up and I would not yet on the bed, he became an arahant and immediately. Now he was qualified to be there because he now has perfect uh, memory, no forgetting. That's why Ananda played the role. That's why he came to be uh, 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 the, uh, the treasurer. But also one other thing, the Buddha knew that of course both Sariputta and Mughalana passed away before him, pre-deceased. Ananda he knew was going to live for 40 more years. So even though the Buddha refused to identify a successor to him, he knew, he said to any other, a number of times that uh, the respect Ananda, then you respect me because respect Dhamma as well. So Ananda, so in the absence of Buddha, Ananda took on the role as the Buddha in terms of teaching, not in terms of the qualities the, or the strengths, but in terms of teaching. So this is, of course, Buddha knew that as well. So that was part of the Buddha's, what I call the, uh, the miracle of teaching. Did I answer your question? Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. I, but of course, uh, in all good answers, there are so many more questions. <laughs> so you, Absolutely. Yeah. So, you and I are coming together later. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to ask a, just a very short follow-up then, because you intrigued me with this, uh, this role of Ananda, who was going to live another 40 years. Does that mean that after, at the first council, uh, Ananda would have been responsible for teaching Pali uh, to the other elders, or had they already at that point uh, learned this language that had been created by the Buddha? My, my sense is that the language that the Buddha created was shared among the Arahants. By that time, they, they come to know. Or may not be everybody, but the leaders like Tariputta and other Kasapa, the leaders, they would have known. And therefore, there's no question of teaching and as, and as you know, was the one who was asked to repeat the line, the words, and then others listened. Mm -hmm. And if they sound, if they found something lacking wrong, then they would interfere. But there was nothing, because there's nobody who knew more than that. And therefore, there's no question of teaching. So this is why it was not taught. It was carried only in, in a, um, orally. Up to the time it was introduced to Sri Lanka in the third in, in the third century BC. But even in Sri Lanka, it was there for two centuries without being written down. And only in the first century did it come to be written down on, on paper in oil or leaves. Uh, uh, thank you very much for both the questions and the answers. Uh, that really clarifies a lot of things for me too. Uh, but I think it is time for us to turn to our second uh, presenter today, uh, Upasika Eleanor. Um, I have heard of Upasika Eleanor's name many, many times uh, over the years uh, for the many great work that she has done um, both uh, within Toronto and also uh, for the courses that she, she has been teaching for the Department of Religious Studies. Okay. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Upasika Eleanor to you. Um, um, Upasika Eleanor uh, is also known as Dr. Eleanor Pontoriero. Uh, she has been practicing Buddhism since 1985. She took formal refuge and lay precepts in the Mahayana and then uh, in uh, the Theravada. She continues daily and formal Dharma practice and retreats with both monastic and lay teachers in the Aja Cha and uh, Sayada Yu. Um, uh, Pandita lineages in the international and local context. She continues to engage in Sutta and Dharma study in Pali with Theravada monastic and lay teachers. She is a longtime member of the board and steering committee and facilitator with the Theravada Buddhist community in Toronto. She is also a longtime member, elder Kavyanamita or spiritual friend and facilitator with Satipana Inside Meditation Toronto, and a member of the Ottawa Buddhist uh, Society Canada. 
since 2002, um, um, Upasika Eleanor has taught religious ethics, women, human rights, and peace building, peace building in comparative context at the University of Toronto. She mentors youth groups engaged in UN and UN women grassroots projects for peace, equity, and development locally and globally. Upasika Eleanor is a member of Buddhist Christian Studies and Sakya Dita International Association of Buddhist Women. As a not-for-profit endeavor, she guides devotional, contemplative, and meditative practices in Buddhist and interfaith contexts in the community. So, um, uh, Upasika Eleanor, let me uh, turn this over to you. Thank you. So let's begin in the traditional way by paying homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa putang damang sangang namasami. Homage to the blessed, noble, and fully awakened one. To the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, I go for refuge. Good afternoon, venerables, Dhamma sisters and brothers, friends. I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the Center for Religion and its context, Emmanuel College, and the Mahadamika, Mahayana Pure Land, Fo Hin, and Toronto West End Buddhist Temples for sponsoring this event. Deep gratitude to Venerable Professor Bhikkhu Mejita for organizing and for his kind invitation. Thank you all for coming together in solidarity in these challenging times. I dedicate this presentation to my teachers, both monastic and lay, who have transmitted the Buddhist teachings for future generations. And to my students, may they kindle the light of peace and justice in the world. My presentation has three parts. A brief introduction to the Terigata, its significance for gender equity, and the verses of Punika and Soma on liberation. The word Terigata consists of two words in the Pali. Teri meaning women elders or women who have grown in wisdom and Gata meaning verse or song. This is the earliest Buddhist scripture by women of their spiritual realizations from the 6th century BCE, contemporary to the historical Buddha. The Terigata is classified as part of the Kudaka Nikaya in the Theravada Buddhist scriptures, the Pali Canon. It was passed on orally until about 80 BCE. By the first century, these verses were transcribed into Pali in Sri Lanka. Later, the monk Dhammapala wrote a Pali commentary on the Terigata. In 1909, Carolyn Reese Davids published the first English translation. Modern translations consist of approximately 72 collected verses by the early nuns. Others are scattered in the Pali Canon. The Terigata or verses of awakening by the early Buddhist nuns express joy in having realized genuine freedom and the ultimate peace of Nibbana. They also describe the challenging circumstances that they have overcome in their former lives. This is a significant scripture for women, for social reformers, and for the Dalit community. 
who are drawn to the Buddhist teachings, offering inner freedom and self-determination. These verses also express the significant relationships between women teachers and their female disciples. For example, the early nun and teacher Patachara, who led many of her students from difficult lives to spiritual liberation. In the numbered discourses one, verses 235 to 247, the Buddha names his first and foremost female monastic disciples. The Buddha confirms, the foremost of my nun disciples in sonority is Mahapajapati Gotami. Foremost in great wisdom is Kema. Foremost in psychic abilities is Upalavana. Foremost in monastic law is Patachara. Foremost in teaching the Dhamma is Dhammadina. Foremost in meditative absorption is Nanda. Foremost in energy is Sona. Foremost in clairvoyance is Sakula. Foremost in swift insight is Bada Kundalakisa. Foremost in recollecting past lives is Bada Kapulani. Foremost in penetrative insight is Bada Kachana. Foremost among ascetics is Kisakotami. And foremost in faith is Singala Kamata. These are the female ancestors that we honor in the Theravada lineage. This passage from scripture is chanted by monastic and lay women. Part two of my presentation focuses on how the Tirigata sets an historical precedent for gender equity in the contemporary context. First, it confirms the Buddha's view that men and women are equal in their potential for spiritual realization. For example, in the Anguttara Nikaya 851, the Gotami Sutta, the Buddha explicitly states that women are capable of the highest level of spiritual attainment and that women can realize all four levels of awakening. The highest of these is the Arahant, who realizes the three knowledges that the Buddha himself realized during his awakening under the Bodhi tree, rebirth, the moral law of Kama, and the Four Noble Truths. These realizations led to liberation, deep peace, equanimity, Nibbana. In his first sermon, the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, or setting in motion the wheel of Dhamma, the Buddha explains the noble eightfold path, the Arya Maga, to this end. Secondly, the Terigata confirms the Buddha's wish of establishing a fourfold Sangha, or community, including men and women, monastic and lay people, to continue the Buddha Sasana the Buddha's teachings for future generations. As recorded in the Diga Nikaya 16, the Maha Parinibbana Sutta. These passages are often cited as a support in the contemporary context for gender equity, which includes the issue of women's higher ordination as bhikkhuni. The higher ordination recognizes women as teachers, and leaders in the Sangha or Buddhist community. This is key in supporting, training, and empowering women and girls, both monastic and lay. Gender equity is important for establishing peace and justice in our local and global community. According to Bhikkhu Analyo, the issue of higher or bhikkhuni ordination traces the legality of its lineage to the Theravada Buddhist scriptures and the Buddha's establishment of a first community of nuns in the 6th century before the Common Era. The first to request ordination was Mahapajapati Gotami, the Buddha's aunt and foster mother, who cared for him after his mother died. The Buddha was initially reluctant to ordain her 
and the other women because of the dangers facing female ascetics in ancient India. In light of this, he suggested that women could wear monastic robes and shave their heads as monks did, but live at home. However, after his attendant Ananda pleaded on the women's behalf, the Buddha first ordained Mahapajapati Gotami and then the other women by giving them eight special rules or Guru Dhammas. These regulated the relationship of the female monastics as being subordinate to and dependent on the male monastics, reflecting the social norms of that time. Bhikkhu Analyo, Bhikkhu Kasuma, and others have questioned these eight rules. These eight rules and the Bhikkhuni Patimoka or rules of conduct for female monastics remains extant to the present. In the contemporary context where the Bhikkhuni lineage is missing or has died out, there have been alternative forms of female renunciants who take 10 ethical precepts and may live in community with other women. In the Theravada, there has been a revival of the higher ordination for female monastics and as teachers and leaders in their communities in Asia and elsewhere. This has been possible with the support of female and male monastics in both the Theravada and Mahayana lineages, as well as with the support of Sakyadita International Association of Buddhist Women. Two foremost pioneers in this revival in the Asian context are Bhikkhuni Damananda of Thailand, formerly Dr. Chatsumarn Kabul Singh, a Buddhist scholar, and the late Bhikkhuni Kasuma of Sri Lanka, who passed away recently from COVID. In the American context, there is Bhikkhuni Panabati and Bhikkhuni Aya Tataloka. In the Canadian and Western Thai forest tradition of Ajahn Chah, there is Bhikkhuni Aya Medanandi and her three female monastic disciples, Bhikkhunis Aya Ahimsa, Aya Nimala, and Aya Anaruda. Part three of my presentation focuses on how the Terigata is a significant Buddhist scripture for women, social reformers, and for marginalized peoples. It speaks to the Buddhist teachings of liberation, that all people, regardless of gender, race, and social status, have the potential for, can realize, and have realized genuine inner freedom. The verses of the early Arahant Nan Punika are significant in this regard. It is recorded that Punika was born a daughter of low caste indentured servants in the house of a wealthy Brahmin. Her ancestors were Aboriginal non-Aryan peoples. Punika would often listen to the Buddha's teachings. She is recorded as having attained the first level of awakening while still a servant, after hearing the Buddha's sermon called the Lion's Roar, wherein the Buddha explains that there are four types of unwholesome clinging based on ignorance, which includes attachment to rites and rituals, Pila Bhatta Paramasa. In her verses of awakening, Punika expounds the Dhamma to the Brahmin of the house, during his daily purification ritual performed by all high caste Hindu men. That of bathing in the local river to purify unwholesome deed. Punika says to the Brahmin, if water could purify you of unwholesome deeds, then turtles and fish would also be pure. The only way to purify your mind and heart Brahmin is not to rely on rites and rituals, but to take refuge in the Buddha, in the Dhamma's teachings that lead to genuine freedom and in the Sangha or community of the Buddha's disciples. 
Additionally, Punika encourages the Brahmin to commit to the five lay daily ethical precepts to refrain from harming, stealing, sexual misconduct, false and harmful speech, and intoxicants. As a result of her teaching, the Brahmin is transformed and becomes a disciple of the Buddha. It is recorded that Punika is later granted her freedom from indentured servitude so that she can ordain as a nun and eventually attains awakening. The Buddhist teachings from the Vasala Sutta, Discourse on the Outcasts, is especially relevant here. The Buddha says, one is an outcast not by birth, but by unwholesome actions. One is a Brahmin, not by birth, but by wholesome actions. This is a radical overturning of the social and political conventions and hierarchy based on social status, intersecting with race and gender. In the Buddha's teachings, purity of heart and mind is not based on social status, but on the mental and spiritual cultivation of sila, ethics, samadhi, meditation, and panya, wisdom. This teaching is as significant today as it was in the Buddha's time. The verses of the early Buddhist nun Soma found in both the Bhikkhuni Samyutta and the Terigata similarly express the Buddha's radical teaching that we are not determined by our past or conditions. Soma describes her awakening as freedom from self-doubt. Negative judgments that she has internalized from others, especially from a misogynist society. As she sits in meditation one day, self-doubt arises, personified as the voice of Mara. That state so hard to achieve, he says, which is to be attained by seers, cannot be attained by a woman with her two-fingered wisdom. That is the limited capacity of a female who knows only how to cook rice. By applying wise effort, Sama Vayama, Soma sees these thoughts for what they are, impermanent, anicca, conditioned, and a cause of suffering, dukkha, when identified with, and not me, not mine, not myself, anatta. Soma's perception shifts, and she affirms that it does not matter whether she is male or female. What matters is that the mind is well concentrated and that there is liberating insight. The Buddhist teaching in the Anattalakana Sutta, the discourse on not self, is relevant here. Mental formations are impermanent, conditioned, a source of dukkha, and not a permanent self. There are two key aspects to this teaching in the context of Soma's realization. First, unwholesome habitual patterns of thinking internalized from society about one's gender, race, and social status hinder our practice. These are to be recognized, denourished, abandoned. This is a process of deconditioning unwholesome patterns by way of right mindfulness, samasati. However, Soma makes a wholesome affirmation that liberation is beyond gender. In our practice, this facilitates reconditioning, that is the cultivation and nourishing of wholesome ways of being and doing, supported by the ethical precepts, the parami or virtues, and the sublime attitudes or Brahma Viharas of metta, loving kindness, compassion, karuna, mudita, sympathetic joy, and upeka, equanimity. In summary, the Terigata has a significant place in Theravada Buddhist scriptures with a deep and profound liberatory message for women and all peoples. 
especially those who are marginalized. It also sets a precedent for gender equity, affirming the roles of leadership for monastic and lay women and their potential and ability for spiritual realization, benefiting themselves and all beings. The verses of Punika and Soma express how the Buddha's teachings are a way for us to cultivate inner freedom, genuine peace, which can be a catalyst for social and political engagement for peace and justice in our global community. So now sharing the merit of this presentation. Sabe Sapta Sabaduka Panmuchan Tu. May all beings be released from all suffering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pasika Eleanor. Uh, you finished right on time. My uh, alarm just rang uh, at the 20 minutes uh, info. So um, I wonder uh, if we have some time for questions and answers before we turn to our third speaker today. If not, um, then allow me to introduce to you our third speaker, uh, Professor Martin Adam, who will be presenting on a kind of counterpart to the Terigata uh, that um, uh, Upasika uh, Eleanor has presented. Uh, it will be uh, his presentation on the elders' verses. Um, professor Adam is uh, associate professor in Pacific and Asian Studies at the University of Victoria. He received his PhD from McGill University in 2003, and his area of, area of research specialization is Indian Buddhism with more general interests in other South Asian re religious traditions, such as Hinduism and Jainism. His other areas of expertise include a history of Buddhism, Indian philosophy and religions, philosophy of religion, socially engaged Buddhism and ethics. He was conducting research in the area of early Indian Buddhist meta ethics, and he is currently serving as a director of the Religious Studies Program at the University of Victoria. Uh, Professor Adam. Hi, <clears throat> thank you for that kind introduction, Henry. And thank you uh, to uh, all of you for being here today, especially to the organizers and sponsors uh, and to uh, Viku Mihita who uh, invited me uh, not so very long ago to give a, a presentation or two at this uh, literary festival. And so uh, I was happy to try to put together the following presentation as well as the one uh, I have for tomorrow uh, in fairly short order. And so um, I think it's lovely and appropriate that I would follow the preceding um, uh, presentation, which I thoroughly enjoyed and want to compliment the speaker on. Uh, naturally because the text I'm going to uh, talk about today is is the natural counterpart to uh, the Terigata. We're talking today about the, I'm talking about the Teragata, and I'll get to talking about it in a moment, but one thing I think is particularly opportune and fortuitous is the way that Upasika Eleanor um, showed the uh, contemporary relevance of this text that she was dealing with and uh, that is actually uh, fortuitous because I've decided in my presentation to try to do something similar, but along uh, different lines. And so this becomes clear <clears throat> from the uh, title of my talk, which I've added of late uh, as I worked through uh, reading the Terragata again for um, uh, uh, the most recent iteration of that experience. I read the text a long time ago and then decided uh, once given the invitation to go over the entire thing again. And I read it with a particular eye, you can say, on a contemporary issue which concerns us all, and that is the environment. So my title is A Creative Study of Nature Imagery in the Terragata Chapter One, A Call to Environmental Preservation. Now that title may seem counterintuitive. Uh, after all, 
Buddhism has sometimes been characterized as at best indifferent to environmental concern, particularly early, early Buddhism. Uh, take the following example, and I'm going to do a screen share. I hope it works. Uh, tell me if you can see this. Oh, host has disabled participant screen sharing. So I just need to show the screen and I'm gonna use this on a couple of occasions. So if you could just enable that. Yeah, Martin, you're enabled. Okay. I, so, I, you're a co-host. Okay, so let's just do this again. Um, can you see this? Hold on. Can you see this? Is Looks that, great. Yes. Yeah. So this, now, yes. this is a quote uh, from a very uh, great scholar of Buddhist studies, Lambert Schmidthausen, and it, it's just what I. It's basically what I would like to address today. Uh, this is from his 1997 article in the Journal of Buddhist Ethics. The ultimate analysis and evaluation of existence in early Buddhism does not seem to confer any value on nature, neither on life as such, nor on species, nor on ecosystems. The ultimate value and goal of early Buddhism, absolute and definitive freedom from suffering, decay, death, and impermanence, cannot be found in nature. It does not motivate efforts for preserving nature, not to mention restoring it, nor efforts for transforming or subjugating it by means of technology. It only motivates the wish and effort to liberate oneself from all constituents of both personal existence and the world. So I'm gonna leave this up there and I'm gonna scroll down in a minute to look at some other, some verses from the Teragata. Uh, but obviously I wish to dispel uh, Pro Professor uh, Schmidthausen's sentiment, uh, basing my thoughts mainly on the Teragata. And my argument is actually very simple uh, and can be summed up as follows. Yes, it's true that samsara is sorrowful, transient, and not subject to our control. Yet, it is in accord with the Buddha's teachings to wisely work to minimize suffering to the extent that this is possible for one. People and three, people and sentient beings suffer less and enjoy more within a healthy environment. It follows that the natural world should be protected according to the early Buddhist ethos. So that's basically what I'm gonna to argue today. I'm not going to uh, uh, go over each of those premises in detail. I regard the argument as relatively unproblematic, um, but I'd be happy to discuss those assertions during the question period. Uh, the one exception is premise number three, which is uh, that people and sentient beings suffer less and enjoy more within a healthy en environment. And I'm going to talk about that uh, today. There are many obvious ways in which it is true that sentient beings suffer less and enjoy more within a healthy environment. Clearly, a healthy environment is one that supports the functioning of healthy human beings. And this is a pre precondition for people to enjoy what life may have to offer. But here, as we are engaged in a literary festival, I'm going to focus on one such enjoyment, the human experience of the beauty of nature, as evidenced for in this text. In brief, I will show that the experience of natural beauty is valued both in itself and as an instrumental value in motivating one's practice. But first, a few words about the context and structure of the text. As for the context, the Teragata is found in the Kutaka Nikaya of the Pali Canon. While it is clearly very, very ancient, it is possible that it did not reach its final form until the time of the Third Council in 247 BCE at Pataliputra. Notable translations exist, uh, and those are those of uh, Carolyn A. F. Rice Davids in 1913 and K. R. Norman in 1969. I have mainly relied on the recent translation by Bhikkhu Sujato and Jessica Walton, which is available online. The structure of the text, it concerns, it, sorry, it consists of 1,289 verses composed by monks, many of whom lived at the time of the Buddha himself. The chapters are divided into groups according to their number. So we have, chap we have in chapter one, those with only one verse, followed by chapter two, with the twos and so on up to 14. After 14, the pattern dissolves and the text finishes with larger groupings. The verses are entitled according to their speakers. For example, Ananda, 
and Angulimala, to take two of the more famous among them. In what follows, I will be looking only at a personal, personal selection of verses that I chose, mainly taken from the, almost exclusively taken from the first uh, chapter of the text. What is the purpose of this text? I take the purpose of the text to be principally one of inspiration. It is not really a theoretical text. It is a poetic one meant to captivate its audience. The verses reflect the inner reality of monks who have committed to the Buddha's path, and more particularly, a life of renunciation as a monk. This inner reality includes feelings of relief, determination, joy, peace, and freedom. As such, the verses are clearly meant to inspire the audience to follow the Buddha's path. The benefits of renunciation encompass seeing reality as it is, and this includes a clearer perception not only of the sorrowful aspects of life that lead to renunciation, but also, interestingly, a clearer perception of the natural world and its beauties. Reality as it is, is two-sided, replete with dukkha, surely, and this is the side that gets most of the attention and justifiably so, but it is also beautiful. So let's look at a couple of the verses for which the text is uh, known. So this is, uh, this is probably, uh, well, this is a, a well-known one. It's the first one that, I, basically what I've done is I've highlighted the, in green, uh, the appropriate color, the, the natural uh, images uh, that uh, are featured. So this is uh, 113 Vanavacha. They look like blue-black storm clouds glistening, cooled by the waters of clear flowing streams and covered with ladybird beetles. I should have highlighted that one too. These cro rocky crags delight me. In this verse, natural phenomena are viewed as delightful in and of themselves, not because of any instrumental, any instrumental value they may have. In other verses, a particular aspect of nature, of nature or a natural moment or an experience of nature is related or compared to a specific aspect of the path, such as meditation or morality, which is, which is, then, which is through the verse enjoined to the audience. Take this verse where one is called upon to practice jhana. So this is chitaka, and this is probably one of the most famous verses from the text. Crested peacocks with beautiful blue necks cry out in Karambri. Aroused by a cool breeze, they awaken the sleeper to practice jhana. And I've highlighted in blue the Buddhist concepts with which the images are linked. So these natural phenomena are beautiful in themselves, but there is an added value. The function of the observations is clear. It is to awaken the aspiration to practice. In this verse, the natural beauty of the world calls out to Chitika. It reminds him of something he has to do. There is an affinity between the loveliness of the peacock and its accompanying cool breeze and jhana. Chitika is suddenly triggered by the coalescence of natural phenomena to practice meditation. Why do the beautiful peacocks and cool wind remind him of jhana? Could it be that jhana is also in its own way beautiful? and cooling to the mind? Is the parallel intended? Let's look at another verse. Sirivada. Lightning flashes down on the cleft of Vibhara and Pandava. But in the mountain cleft, the son of the inimitable is absorbed in jhana, equanimous. Here, it is possible that lightning is intended as a, a parallel to jhana. It is electrifying and provides sudden moments of illumination. It is powerful. But it is also clear that in this verse, the lightning represents tumult and distraction, but not so powerful as jhana. The verse suggests power then, and power can be dangerous. One can easily be overwhelmed by natural forces. Hence, there are some verses in which those forces appear in a negative light. Here are two more. 
Let's start with the Vimala. The rain falls and the wind blows on Mother Earth while lightning flashes across the sky. But my thoughts are still. My mind is serene in Samadhi. So rain, sky, as you please. Godika. The sky rains down like a beautiful song. My little hut is roofed and pleasant, sheltered from the wind. My mind is serene in Samadhi. So rain, sky, as you please. The weather here clearly represents tumult and distraction, contrasted with samadhi. They may be beautiful, these phenomena, but they are a distraction. A negative use of nature imagery can also be seen in the following verse. Devasab. I've crossed the marshes, I've avoided the cliffs, I'm free from floods and fetters, and I've destroyed all, all conceit. In this verse, nature-based metaphors are employed to rep represent obstacles on the path. Contrast this with the following, Usaba. The trees on the mountaintops have grown well, spring freshly sprinkled by towering clouds. For Usaba, who loves seclusion and who thinks only of wilderness, Goodness arises more and more. Usaba's practice is enhanced by the seclusion of the wilderness, which gives birth to wholesome mental states. Usaba thinks only of the trees and the towering clouds, the natural world. And this gives rise to goodness itself. Again, I would argue that there is a natural affinity between the loveliness of nature and the healthy mental states. Nature is lovely in itself, but it also has an instrumental value here in that it gives rise to goodness within the practitioner. Whereas in the earlier verses we examined, it was jhana and samadhi, which is to say meditation that arose, here the concept is one of morality. In the following verse, there isn't even a mention of a related theoretical concept. It will be recalled that this was also true of the first verse as well, which was also from the same uh, elder, Vanavacha. So this is uh, Vanavacha 1113. Uh, the water is clear and the gorges are wide. Monkeys and deer are all around, festooned with dewy moss. These rocky crags delight me. The water, the rock formations, the animals, the plants, all are delightful. The next two end the chapter, and I'll read them together. Vajiputta. You've gone to the jungle, the root of a tree, putting Nibbana in your heart. Practice jhana, Gautama. Don't be heedless. What is this hullabaloo to you? Isadatta. The five aggregates are fully understood. They remain, but the root is severed. I have realized the end of suffering and attained the end of defilement. So, my conclusion. According to the early, Buddha, early Buddhist worldview, nature it does indeed contain beauty. Delightful. It can be delightful, grand, powerful, ennobling. But the Buddhism does not, on a theoretical level, posit beauty as one of the general attributes of existence. And there is a reason for this. It is not because there is no beauty to be found in the world. The reason is simply that the Buddha's teachings only concern the arising and cessation of suffering. One general other general characteristics of existence may obtain, but they are not the focus of the Buddha's teaching. Note that not all things we normally find beautiful are praised in the text. 
Indeed, the apparent beauty, and this is a notable exception, the apparent beauty of the female body is specifically negated. It is said to be illusory and dangerous. So there's a couple of verses from later on that I'll just read to demonstrate this and talk about. Um, so this is Nagasamala from the fourth chapter. I entered for alms and while going along, I glanced at her, adorned with jewelry and all dressed up like a snare of death laid down. Other phenomena may be dangerous, but non, none so much as the opposite sex. Why? Obviously, there is a danger in attachment. So here we get to the last verse I'll deal with. Your mind is on fire because of a perversion of perception. Avoid noticing the attractive aspect of things that provokes lust. Okay. So, and here's the point. Beauty is valued in the text when it's not dangerous. When one can see it without attachment and let it go. When it comes to sexual beauty, that's not really possible. So where does that leave us? Buddhist wisdom consists in knowing about the arising of dukkha and the way to bring about its cessation. As one progresses along the path, one's capacities are enhanced, one's skill develops. Presumably, a wise monk, just as much as a wise lay person, will recognize opportunities to alleviate suffering and will do so in skillful ways. This suggests that an ecological ethic may not be so alien to the early Buddhist ethos after all, and that monks who engage in environmental activism are acting in a way that flows directly from the Buddha's exhortation. Bhikkhus, go out in, in, in all the eight directions for the mundane and supramundane welfare, prosperity and happiness of many beings. So is the value of nature only instrumental, which is to say value valuable only insofar as it facilitates the practice of the Buddha's path? Or is it inherently valuable, worthy of preservation and protection for its own sake? The answer would appear to be both. We have seen that natural beauty is valued in the Theragata, both for its own sake and for its ability to inspire practice. Indeed, the Theragata itself, as a poetic work, demonstrates this fact. Beauty resonates within the human heart, inspiring us to a higher calling, the practice of the path. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Erdem. I do have a question, uh, if you don't mind asking this yes. first. Um, um, the gata in um, the, the composition of the Theragata, uh, do they refer more as verses or songs? The gata is, for, sorry, the, it's the songs. Do you mean the meaning of the- The, the meaning of the word gata. It's a, it's a song, it's a verse, yeah. And so if uh, they were oh, songs, were they supposed to be sung? Um, ah. Or, you know, composed according to a set kind of me uh, melody? That's a very good question. And honestly, I'm not the one to answer it. Some of the members of the audience may very well know that. Um, my understanding is that the, the meters uh, conform to poetic meters that were uh, in use in India at the time. And uh, that in point of fact, they are similar in some ways to some love poetry that was around at the time. Uh, but I do not know whether it was sung or not. That, that is something maybe we have some Indologists and some experts in the early tradition who know that here. I, I would think so. I, I don't think so. I think they were simply written to express their feelings, uh, not to be sung, anything like that. But at that time, remember, only they would have known it because it was not public property to sing. Mm -hmm. Only later, the, those who knew that, like Ananda, would have been able to write them down. So I don't think it was intended to be sing, sung or it was ever sung. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the question. Thank you. And sorry, one more question. Um, uh, the Degata in the Mahayana Sutras, uh, of course, were written in Sanskrit. 
uh, do they follow this the same kind of metrical like system as they do in the Pali Gata? I would double check on that. I don't know. Uh, I suspect they do, uh, but uh, I just haven't done a comparative study of the two, so I can't I can't answer it off the top of my head. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Well, thank you very much. If no more questions, then we'll turn to our next speaker, um, uh, Mr. Terry Watada. Are you here, uh, Mr. Watada? Terry's video is not on. Okay. Uh, but uh, oh, maybe uh, home. yeah. There you go. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay, great. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Watada to you. Uh, I've been using his book on the history of the Buddhist churches of Canada uh, so many times in my courses. Uh, Terry Watada is a Toronto writer with many productions and publications to his credit. He composed the Japanese Canadian children's history section and the Japanese, Chinese, and South Asian Canadian history sections for the National Library and Archives of Canada website. Through his close association with Buddhism and the Asian community, uh, Mr. Watada has a unique knowledge and feeling for uh, the Japanese form of pure land practice, Jodo Shinshu. Uh, the Toronto Buddhist Church History Committee looked for Mr. Watada to write a history of Jodo Shinshu across Canada, resulting in the publication Bukyo Dozen, uh, A History of Buddhism in Canada, 1905 to 1995. His other publications include Light at a Window, uh, The Game of a Hundred Ghosts, the sword, the metal, the metal, and the rosary, uh, and the TBC in the Toronto Buddhist Church, 1995 to 2010. For his writing, music, and community volunteerism, uh, Mr. Watada was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal and the National Association of Japanese Canadians National Merit Award in 2013. He received in 2014 the Gordon Hirabayashi Human Rights Award, an honor given every two years by the National Association of Japanese Canadians. And today uh, we are happy to, um, uh, to have Mr. Watada to share with us a reading from his latest novel. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to read a section from my novel, The uh, Mysterious Dreams of the Dead. Um, <clears throat> so that's my third novel. Uh, I was born and raised uh, a Buddhist in the east end of Toronto. And, um, and so when I write, um, whether it be poetry or a fiction, I'd like to infuse it with uh, my Buddhist background. And so uh, this section that I'm reading is about the old uh, Japantown. Well, it wasn't called Japantown, but the area that uh, the Japanese Canadians settled in Toronto just after the war and through to the 1990s. And so this is uh, my protagonist taking his uh, translator girlfriend home for Oshogatsu or New Year's. And so here's the section. I did take her home for Oshogatsu 1991. I was nervous of what she might think, a man in his 30s living with his mom. Then again, the Japanese and Japanese Canadians really don't expect their children to move out until they marry. Naoko was out, but she was a student. She got a pass, I'm sure. The pewter sky was oppressive as we shuffled along Sullivan Street from the art gallery streetcar stop at Beverly Street. The sidewalk was hard, brittle, and unyielding, but the bare trees bent over slightly as if to welcome us. The front yards and gardens were empty since there had been no snow since last November when the first fall came as a flurry but didn't stick. 
We walked hand in hand, or rather glove and mitten. From within her heavy coat and hood, Naoko kept looking at the house numbers zipping by, anxious to find my mom's place. I peered into the surrounding darkness, imagining the shadows of little Tokyo accompanying us. It actually wasn't called Little Tokyo or Japantown or J-Town back in the 1950s and 60s. It was just the neighborhood where we lived. Every Nikkei individual and institution started life in Toronto there. The Watadas lived on McCall Street. The Ishidas, the Matsubas, Kiyonagas, Nakamuras, Shitsugiuras, Tabuchis, and so many others lived on adjoining streets. The first Toronto Buddhist church started in a row house on Huron Street. The Reverend Tsuji and his wife lived in that crowded space. The planning of the Buddhist church on Buddhist took on Bathurst took place there, as the, that did that of the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center. Members of the various Kenjin Kai and the political arm of the community, the Japanese Canadian Citizens Association, met in the back room of the Nikko Garden Restaurant. The New Canadian and the Continental Times both on Queen Street near Spadina kept churning out weekly issues with community news for a shrinking subscriber base. Nikkei businesses sprang up within the confines. The Tucci brothers opened an auto repair garage in a back alley, illegal, but it made money. A Japanese and later English language bookstore operated by Kamaoka-san ran out of his house on Sullivan Street. The Kawasaki corner store with three young brothers always fighting sat at Huron and Dundas. The food co-op nearby operated by the Buddhist church eventually turned into Furiya, a Japanese grocery store. With a somber Mr. Ishida as the butcher and a smiling and friendly Mrs. Ishida on the fish counter. Perched above was Nikko Garden, the first formal dining Japanese restaurant in Toronto, owned and run by Gus and Jim Ki Karunaga brothers who hated each other, so much so that Gus acted as Mater D while Jim worked in the back, or was it the opposite? The farthest out boys east was the Ginza Cafe at Ban Dundas, where anybody could get teishoku, ochazuke, and dembatsuke at the long counter. Other Japanese grocery stores opened and spread out along the nexus of Spadina and Dundas, Sandown Market, Sanko Trading, and the venerable Dundas Union. Harry Sugimoto, his family stuck in a house on Dundas so narrow you could touch each wall by spreading your arms, would soon open Danforth Cleaners in the East End when he made a little money. Dr. Kuabara, family doctor, and Dr. Nakashima, a dentist, were together at Spadina and Bloor. The Nikkei youth also had fun. The Nisei club staged dances while the harvest dance the Sadie Hawkins do and the Christmas social at the Hagerman Hall located right in the heart of the original Chinatown. Much to the dismay of their Issei elders who frowned on touch dancing. Bowling and ice hockey leagues formed. The Sansei attended Japanese language classes twice a week at the YMCA at Young and, Young and College. The Nikkei would not move into the suburbs near and far until later when racist tensions and restrictions eased. If they ended up living in the same neighborhood, never mind street, it was by pure happenstance. Most families did not want to be Japanese Canadians by that point. All the Issei, Nisei homes, businesses and institutions were gone or virtually gone by the 90s, becoming ghosts haunting me as childhood memories does everyone. The New Year's feast had become a little sad too, with no one coming over to visit. Friends and relatives stopped just before the 1990s. Mom made a small amount of sushi, tomaki, and agizushi only. She also prepared a smattering of tempura, morsels of char siu, bought at Golden City, no doubt, and a plate of chow mein, Japanese Canadian style. There was a pot of steamed rice, a stable. We weren't iconoclasts at all, after all. But gone were the days of abundant delicacies, though Boku's mom and others put, still put on the hog. I stopped giving, going, given what happened to my pal. Besides, I was no longer invited, and I understood, too embarrassed, since I knew too much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Father. Um, that um, 
what you described was actually the first um, environment that I came to experience in Toronto. Uh, when I first came to Toronto, I was living on the Cold Street. Okay, so, you know, your description brought back many, many years. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Thank you, Sensei. Okay. Um, any questions? All right, I, I know uh, we'll have uh, more of you tomorrow who will be uh, joining yes. us again tomorrow. So uh, uh, maybe let's move on to the last item uh, for today's event. Uh, let me turn over to uh, Pro Professor uh, uh, Pico Mihita to uh, take us through this last portion of the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Henry, and thank you for everyone to all your presentations. And uh, this introduce the those who have been recognized as pioneers under pioneer recognition in gratitude. Gratitude katanyuta is one of the blessings in the Mahamangal Sutta, but not the Buddha. Its practice is very rare. Most people uh, benefit from something, but then once it's done, then it's forgotten. And then honor is agarava, that is honoring those worthy of honoring, puja, puja, niyana, is, are also two other blessings. These again are not uh, in common practice as in our Canadian society or any Western Sorry, in general, living a Buddhist life is not just to read and study such values, but to live it. One of the first things the Buddha did on the night of the enlightenment was uh, uh, Gautama, Samana Gautama, did was once he understood something, he applied it and say, he found out how to get rid of something, the attachment, he got out of it. That's when he became an arahant. So praxis is very important in, in, in Buddhism. Uh, this is sila. Buddhist praxis is sila. So it is in, for this reason that we decided to introduce the concept so that we can keep re uh, reflecting and practicing it. Now, honoring those worthy of honoring can be characterized in a Buddhian, as a Buddhian praxis in other care, parahita. Those receiving those at the receiving end of honor and gratitude may come to be happy and or neutral. But however, it also ends up as a practice in self-care. This may sound contradictory. Attahita. Since one, the one engaged in the other care also comes to the beneficiary. It serves as a form of what is called nourishment. You may, you may remember from the literature posted on, the, on the, our, our festival that it was to help all of us that are come to be distanced as a result of the COVID to gain some what is called contact food, pasahara, meeting each other, smiling, talking, etc. The Buddha talks about four types of um, nourishment. One is the contact food. The other one, of course, is solid food, which includes liquids, cobbling kahana. But then the third one called the mind intent food, mano sanchetanahara. The very thought of honoring, respecting, showing gratitude, etc., is a form of mind in, in, in food. The Buddha says, Chetanaham Bhikkave Kammam Vadami. Intent, I said earlier, a shadow that leaves you not, as in Dhammapada. So, practicing gratitude is also an exercise in mudita, meaning altruistic joy. Happy that somebody is happy. Happy that somebody has done something good for society and for oneself. These are all called kusala kama, skillful action of the mind. 
and as in the abhidhamma as each and every one kusala enters the consciousness vijnana it generates a good cell and the called anu this then is the form of a mind of mind into nourishment so showing gratitude recognizing others is a form of earning mind into nourishment resulting in health happiness and longevity so honoring those deserving of honor and remembering those who have made contributions in gratitude is a practice of uh, is a practice in both self care and other care which of course is the ideal in buddha dharma and it is for this reason by way of introducing it that as a literary event that we wanted to show our gratitude for those who deserve gratitude respect and honor these are the pioneers who who have enriched uh, kind of literature like terry and others have been introduced uh, through their creative writing of course there are also others who have benefited who have helped uh, uh, in kind of buddha dhamma uh, helped society to benefit from buddha dhamma and hence of course our uh, gratitude towards them as well but it is hoped that the example we are setting will serve as a guideline for the future although the buddhist the fet- festival has ended up being national event so i want to today i uh, and i show gratitude and uh, so we salute them uh, as, uh, and hope that in due time they'll come to be so now with the uh, brief comments i want to now uh, begin to uh, introduce and invite uh, the uh, the i begin with literature and um, i begin with the uh, Asoka Vira Singh who is a pioneer Asian Buddhist Canadian poet in the as far as I know when he came to Canada he had all he was all the poet uh, in England he was uh, uh, in England in UK and then he began to write uh, trail of man kind was adopted as a storyline for Canada's National Museum of Man's Orientation Hall in Ottawa in 1972. You can see the Wikipedia. Now I call upon Asoka, if he's present, to tell us about yourself a little bit, a little bit taking about five minutes. Thank you for the introduction, Bhante. I accept this honor with gratitude for what I have been taught in Buddha's teachings, from what I have understood and translated all that into words of rhyme, which happens to be my Buddhist po- poem, a part of the wisdom of my heart and living. Namo tassa bhagavato. With my gently opened eyes, I see a monarch go south during my winter, but only to die on its way. my acceptance of impermanence thank you this then is the certificate we have developed for the uh, to be given individually pioneer remains in gratitude katanyata it is in metta friendliness that we that we the buddhists of canada offer our respects for the pioneering contributions of asoka vira singha Pani Asian Buddhist Canadian Board. May you continue to be in health and good health, wealth, happiness and calm, and experience Nibbana in due course in a self-discipline of mind, body and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we move on to our next person that we want to and uh, Ragnar as a pioneer in Terry Watada about whom uh, we have uh, uh, heard from the early presentation 
And of course, he's uh, also the author of Bukyo Dozen, History of Buddhism in Canada. And uh, his manuscripts and books are part of the permanent collection at the Thomas Fisher Rare Library, Books Library, at the Robert Library. And he was also awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal and the National Association of Japanese Canadians National Merit Award in 2013. So with that brief introduction, since you have been introduced earlier, I call upon uh, Terry uh, to take about five minutes to say something more about your creative work. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, it, we've known each other a long time, haven't we? <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a wonderful association. And uh, I can truly say that I am honored um, kind of a surprise, and uh, but I will say that I'm not done. <laughs> I will uh, continue to create and hopefully get published. Um, I have a new book uh, in manuscript form. It is about my wife's great aunt who uh, survived the Hiroshima bomb for about two weeks. And during that time, she searched for her twin boys to see if they had survived. Anyway, it's it's been a, a difficult book to write, but um, I do have a manuscript now and a, I am looking for a publisher and I will continue to do so. Um, in the interest of human rights and Buddhism, in itself. So thank you very much. Um, and here's the certificate uh, for the pioneer recognition in Gavanitha, Peace of Canada, you. of our respect for the pioneer contributor Terry Watada, pioneer Asian Buddhist Canadian novelist, in addition to everything else. So may you continue in good health, wealth and happiness and calm and experience Nibbana in the course in a self-discipline of mind, body and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Thank you. Now we call upon um, Kimberly Beek, uh, whom we have not met so far. <laughs> Only three times have we not met so far. <laughs> so we <laughs> invite uh, Kimberly. He, he is the founder, the author of the, not the author, founder of Buddhist Fiction Blog. Um, and of, of, of late, I understand that she's also into young Buddhist adult fiction. So you might want to tell us a little about your work in, uh, in that area. Well, thank you, venerables, colleagues and friends for the invitation to join you today and for your recognition of the Buddhist fiction blog. I'm really humbled that it has been so openly accepted and collegially supported over the years. Um, Buddhist fiction is the locus of my dissertation project, which I am very slowly finishing through McMaster University's Department of Religious Studies. I use Buddhist fiction as a convenient category that allows for the study of contemporary English popular fiction novels and short stories with major Buddhist themes and characters and plots. Um, I was presenting a paper uh, on readers of Buddhist fiction at a conference at the University of British Columbia in 2010, and the interest I received was encouraging. I, I believe actually, John, uh, if you're still with us, that's where I, I first met you was at that conference. In between conference panel sessions, a number of scholars suggested that I start a list that people could access to use fiction in courses or just read for enjoyment. And the idea for the blog was born based on this collective suggestion from doctors uh, Melissa Ann Curley and um, Victor Horry and Jessica Main. So I've been posting on this blog for 10 years. During that time, I've been blessed to have the help of two contributing editors, Chris Beal and Kate Brand, as well as guest contributors who help keep readers interested so they don't always have to read my writing and my views. I'm consistently contacted by authors and scholars about new publications or for suggestions of novels and short stories to add to um, the, my list and to university courses. Um, and the blog has afforded me a wonderful bridge between Buddhism and literature that I might not otherwise have managed um, just uh, in, in the field of Buddhist studies itself. Uh, the Buddhist fiction blog has been a personal blessing as well. 
I moved from Canada to Saudi Arabia in 2015 for my husband's work. So I'm attending tonight from the Arabian desert, actually. And the Buddhist fiction blog has been a collegial and productive way of staying connected with authors and scholars who consistently reach out to alert me about new works. Um, in fact, this is how I met Venerable Professor Bhikkhu Mahita. He contacted me about his 2010 novel, Untouchable Woman's Odyssey, which is a wonderful example of Buddhist fiction. He's always been supportive of my work and has sought to promote all forms of Buddhist literature through various means, including this festival. So following in Venerable Professor Bhikkhu's example, I'm happy to have a small part to play in the promotion of Buddhist literature. And I thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Kimberly, here's your certificate that will be sent to you. Thank you Again, so much. Meta Frenet, that be the Buddhists of Canada, of our respects for the pioneering contributions of Kimberly Beek, founder of the Buddhist Fiction Blog. May you continue in good health, wealth and happiness and calm, and experience Nibbana in due course in a self-discipline of mind, body and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, now we come to a different type on the biography. Uh, this I'm talking about uh, is Ron Graham. He's not with us today, but Ron Graham is a pioneer Buddhist Canadian biographer, not autobiography, not his biography, but, and he's the, uh, an award-winning author and journalist, CBC TV, Saturday Night, etc. But his writing, his biography was on the Prime Minister of Canada, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. It says, the last act, Pierre Trudeau, then the Gang of Eight and the Fight for Canada, my years as Prime Minister. He's also written a, a biography of the Right Honorable Jean Chrétien, the uh, uh, Prime Minister, uh, One-Eyed Kings, God's Dominion, and the French Quarter. Now, so uh, he actually did not even think why I should be mentioned because he had not written about anyone about, about himself. But the idea is the, he was the first to write about uh, write a biography and who was a Buddhist and Kenyan Buddhism. That's why we say that uh, we in Metta, we recognize him and we thank him. Uh, and uh, Metta friends that we are the Buddhists of Canada, of our respect for the pioneer and contributions of Ron Graham, pioneer Buddhist biographer. Thank you, Ron. Uh, may you be well and happy. Thank you. Uh, I am here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Please speak. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm very uh, uh, honored by this uh, this recognition of gratitude, and I'm grateful for it in 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 return. I'm also very humbled by it because, as Bante mentioned, uh, Buddhism is not my primary field of work uh, or study. The book I've only done one book on religion. The others have been about politics and history. Um, some have been biographies. Some have been histories. Some have been more analytical. But uh, um, so I'm humbled and to be in the company of uh, Buddhist writers and people and thinkers who have been dealing with it uh, so straightforwardly. The other reason why I'm humbled and it's not a false modesty is that uh, uh, I've been a practitioner of uh, Buddhist meditation since 1974 as a student of SN Goenka and Theravadan Buddhism and a, a constant practitioner of that as a householder. Um, but uh, one of the things being somebody uh, or gravitating towards things intellectual and academic, one of the things that um, appealed to me about the study with uh, uh, Mr. Guenka was that uh, practice was always more important than theory. Uh, that um, uh, he used to stress that Dhamma is not to be found in books. Wh whoever applies it attains it. And that the practice was much more important than the studying or theorizing about it. So even though you get the basics of the Eightfold Noble Path and the, um, the chain of the dependent order radiation, you're trying to get those basics. Uh, basically, what he encouraged us to do as students was to practice, to use the time that we might have devoted to more academic studies to practice, to sitting on the cushion. And that's something that I've tried to do. Uh, so I'm not a teacher. I'm not, uh, I'm not really a really very exp uh, experienced meditator, despite almost 50 years of practice. Um, I still see myself as a beginner, but I've tried to bring uh, Buddhist ethics and values and metta 
to uh, other fields of uh, my writing and my work at the same time make uh, my own personal progress um, uh, towards uh, Nibbana. Um, but uh, that's why I'm extremely humbled to be in the company of uh, such great scholars and thinkers and authors who've been dealing with this more directly than I am. I've, I really do think I'm not worthy of it, but I'm very, very grateful. Thank you for participating with me. Thank you. And so may you continue to be in good health, wealth, happiness, and calm. And I spend in Nibbana in due course, in the self-discipline of mind, body, and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Now we come to another biographer. That's uh, Tanya Maginity. She's a pioneer in bringing out the uh, book on Buddhist, Canadian Buddhist women uh, in uh, Canada, a biography of their lives and under the title, Lotus Petals in the Snow. This is the first one that I've seen uh, published in later on the average Buddhist person, Buddhist women who are doing their own things and bringing to attention their presence, which would have not been known <clears throat> except for this book. So we recognize Tanya as the pioneer Canadian Buddhist women biographer. And that right now, the book is again, Lotus Petals in the Snow. And I don't know whether she's here or not. There are then the certificate in metal friendliness that we, the Buddhists of Canada, of our respect for the pioneering contribution of Tanya McGinnity, pioneer biographer of Canadian Buddhist women. May you continue to be in good health, wealth, happiness and calm, and experience Nibbana in due course, in a self-discipline of mind, body, and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Now we move on to the educational sphere. As Ron was saying, that is one thing to have knowledge of and go to university, get a doctorate in etc. and Buddhism, but difference in to practice. And one of the things that Professor Jack Miller of Ontario Institute for Studies Education, actually that's where I got my own uh, PhD as well. Uh, he was not there at the time. And uh, uh, he, what he did was to bring contemplative education, introduce mindfulness and things like that to the Ontario um, education system. And uh, as part of the holistic education for over 35 years. He would have been here except that he uh, has a, another uh, engagement. And uh, so uh, he's an author and editor of about 20 books in the field. So I hope that uh, we he, uh, that we now wish to, even though he's not here, that we wish to, uh, he was on the board of Nalanda College of Buddhist Studies on the, on the board, board of directors. Uh, so it's a metta friendly that we, the Buddhists of Canada, offer our respects for the pioneering contribution of Professor Jack Miller, pioneer in incorporating mindfulness meditation uh, in my Ontario education. May you continue to be in good health, wealth, happiness, and calm, and experience Nibbana in due course in a self-discipline of mind, body, and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Now, the next person on the list was uh, Chris Ng, that, but she's not available today, present, and we'll talk about her um, uh, on Sunday. Now, the next part, now we move on to, from the education to the academic. In this context, it is Professor Victor Horry I'd like to introduce. He, as you know, in historical times, so even, even now, if you were a Buddhist, then you're not qualified to teach at a university. We have belief. So, but Professor Victor Horry was one who broke through that. He was a practicing Buddhist, and yet he was appointed, he got an appointment at McGill. And later on, he was, uh, he was the Jehan Namata Buddhist professor at U of T. Now again, uh, he has been active, not only in the academy, 
but also whenever there were conferences, for example, when you had celebrated the 100 days of Buddhism in Canada, he was a speaker. He was a conference speaker. And when I founded the Canadian Journal of Buddhist Studies, he was on the board of editors. So he's been not only an academic, but active. Uh, so how also, also and in addition to that, he was all, also a co-editor co of the first book on Canadian Buddhism, uh, along with John Hardy, uh, John, uh, John Harding and Alexander Susi. And um, uh, uh, the, the uh, thank you, John. <laughs> so he, the, the name is Wild, uh, Canadian Buddhism, Wild Geese Buddhism in Canada. And then this was followed up uh, with another one collection of, uh, again, Canadian Buddhism, sort of second part, Flowers on the Rock. So we uh, re recognize him for, as a pioneer uh, in metta friendliness and uh, as a pioneer in contribution of Professor Victor Hori, early Buddhist practitioner professor. That is the important thing. May you continue good health. He's not retired. May you continue good health, wealth, happiness, and calm and experience Nibbana in due course in a self-discipline of mind, body, and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, John. The next uh, person I'm going to introduce, the Buddhist Canadian, is Professor Janet McClellan. Again, she's also a practitioner, but again, came to be a, 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 the, a professor. Now, she is the first one uh, I had in the 1980s, I had an article in Canadian Studies called Buddhism in Metropolitan Toronto. Well, that's a very small, short article. But Professor Janet McClellan was the one who brought the uh, first collection of articles on Canadian Buddhist communities, Vietnamese and uh, Tibetan and others. And uh, so, she's a, so this is a pioneering author on Canadian Buddhist communities. Of course, she also served on the uh, she, uh, faculty of, I think, uh, the uh, uh, Wilfrid Laurier, but also on the faculty of Nalanda College of Buddhist Studies when it was established. Uh, but however, I've also met her in uh, public uh, events like in Vesak and the Peace March and others. Uh, so it is that we recognize her as the pioneering author on Canadian Buddhist communities. The certificate for her as well. Okay, so it's in metta friendliness that we, the Buddhists of Canada, of our respect for the pioneering contributions of Professor Janet McAllen, author of first publication on Canadian Buddhist communities published by uh, uh, Many Petals of the Lotus, uh, Lot Many Petals, Canadian Buddhism, Many Petals of the Lotus, uh, published by uh, U of T uh, uh, Press. So may you continue good, of course, she's retired too, like uh, Professor Victoria, uh, she's retired too. May you continue to be in good health, wealth, happiness and calm, and experience Nibbana in due course, in a self-discipline of mind, body and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Now finally, we come to uh, the organizational. <laughs> Thank you, Bhante. Well, like Terry Watata said, we certainly have a long journey together. And uh, it's been more than 50 years now since I've been practicing Buddhism. Uh, I remember meeting you back in 1980, as well as many other teachers at that time. And I realized that a lot of my journey has been about building uh, a larger community in Canadian Buddhism. So. Um, the uh, Subaru Press includes not just the, the books that I've published, like Tanya McGinnity's, but also a directory of uh, Canadian Buddhist organizations, which now number more than 600, which is quite amazing, and a news blog of articles about Canadian Buddhism and related subjects, which now totals more than 1,400 entries. Of the many Buddhist books that I've published in the last 12 years, uh, more than 30 of them are by Canadian authors. So we clearly have a vibrant 
Canadian Buddhist literary scene. And I see my role as really helping to, to nurture that in any way that I can. So Terry, if you're looking for a new uh, publisher for your next novel, please contact me. <laughs> and Ron Green, Ron Graham, I'll probably be contacting you too, uh, because I want to see more flourishing of uh, Buddhist work in Canada. So, uh, uh, you know, as I said before, thank you, Bonte, uh, for all of your pioneering efforts. Uh, you know, we should be giving you a certificate of gratitude for all the things that you've done for the Dharma in Canada in uh, for really a very, very long time. And that's very commendable. So I will just say uh, thank you. And, and I just want to add also, it's very uh, gratifying to me to see a lot of the people whose names I recognize, like I see Gianta there, hello Gianta, and uh, Chris Ng, who I've known for a long time. There's a, a lot of wonderful people uh, in our expanded community. And I think that when I first began to practice Buddhism, one of the things that I really felt was missing was Sangha. And over the last 50 years, that, that Sangha, that community, has really grown, has really matured, has really uh, flowered in a lot of different ways. And, and for that, I'm, I'm very grateful. So thank you. And we have, uh, yeah. Here's a certificate. Is it Metta Fenna that we, the Buddhists of Canada, of our respect for the pioneering contributions of John Negru, early Buddhist community leader and publisher. May you continue to be in good health, wealth, happiness and calm, and expand the barn in due course in a self discipline of mind, body, and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Um, now we come to another uh, uh, person with a religious organization, and this was Jayanta Shirley Jonathan. Uh, I've never met her, and I know of her. <laughs> the first time I'm seeing you, <laughs> Jayanta. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, <laughs> but we have communicated several times, yeah. And uh, she is the founder president of Sakya Dita Canada. Now, as you know, Sakya Dita means daughter of the Buddha. It's an international organization, but there's a formed uh, after the first bhikkhuni ordination in India. Um, and uh, the now, however, it has branches and there has a branch in Canada as well. And uh, she become then the uh, as a founder president of. Uh, Sakadita, uh, the Association of Buddhist Women. Uh, in fact, she was a founder of Stretch Awareness in 1985 as uh, uh, part of the uh, SI uh, Stretch Awareness, formed the Calgary Women's Dharma Forum, a support group of women from all Buddhist traditions. And she's uh, continuing that. Now, there's also, of course, an upcoming uh, online online uh, international association, international meeting of the Sakadita International. And I think uh, we can talk about it later, but uh, so please uh, uh, tell us about yourself, about your work. Thank you, Bhante. It's nice to see you and all the other guests. Really nice to, as John just said, to feel like we're part of the Sangha. I think that's just, for me, very special. So I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, like John, I've been practicing um, seriously, uh, over 50 years uh, in Buddha Dhamma. And uh, in 1987, um, I had invited Ayakema, Venerable Ayakema from Germany, to come to Calgary to lead a retreat, a meditation retreat. Unknown to me, she had just come from Bogaya in India, where it was the first nuns meeting that was taking place. And she came and she said to me, I think you should set up a Canadian organization and be the Canadian representative. So I did that. That was 30 years ago. So the time has gone quickly. Sakyadita Canada um, is a Canadian organization. We're still going strong. In fact, it's getting stronger. Um, I have now just uh, resigned as president. So we have a, a, a new board uh, taking, taking over and, and, and taking it forward. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, 
the whole goal uh, when I talked to Ayakema about Sakyadita was to bring women, lay women and Buddha, um, ordained women together. And I, for, for whatever reason, I was born with um, the ordained women in my heart. And it's just something that's always been, I've been drawn to. Um, and not just the Canadians, um, but, but internationally. So I started attending the Sakadita International Conferences. So after the one in 1987, the next conference was held in Thailand and 1991. So I attended that as the Canadian representative. Chatsuman Kabat Singh um, was the one who organized it. She is now Venerable Damananda. And we have our next international conference um, is this December. And it's the first time we've done this online. And uh, it's looking really good. So if any of you are interested, uh, Google it. Um, Calgary, uh, no, pardon me, Calgary. Sakyadida International and all the information's there. They are now doing registrations for it. And uh, would love to see you. Uh, many of you there. Uh, I think I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll, I'll close there and just say I'm really honored and humbled um, to get this uh, certificate on behalf of Sakadita Canada. Thank you, Bhante. So it is in Metta, friend, that we, the Buddhists of Canada, of our respect for the pioneering contribution of Jayanta Shirley Jonathan, founding president. Sakadita Canada. May you continue to be in good health, wealth, happiness, and calm, and experience Nibbana in due course in a self discipline of mind, body, and word. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And we now come to the last uh, uh, person, last uh, um, uh, item, last, last person to be introduced. And um, this is uh, Professor John Bertrand. Uh, he was the, uh, he's from the United Church of Canada. He was the interfaith officer at the time I worked with him. And I tell you the history. We know that we had the first uh, Buddhists coming together in 1980. It was following that, that we had the Vesak uh, in 1981. But how did it that we happened to come together in 1980? Certainly not by initiative, uh, it what happened was just following my doctorate in 1978, I had become a member of the WCRP, World Conference on Religion for Peace, a Japanese outfit. And there was also uh, Sensei Fujikawa, uh, the, from the, the minister at the Toronto Buddhist Church. Now, member of this WCRP was also the Canadian Council of Christians. Now, the Canadian Council of Christians were interested in having an interfaith service. And it was, the leadership was given by the United Church of Canada. And uh, John Bertram, who then uh, organized it and then helped and asked us to come together. When, uh, but we didn't know when we were invited, there were no Buddhists that we knew. There was the, the Chinese temple, there was the Sinhalese temple, but there was also um, a Korean temple and maybe a Tibetan temple, but that's, that's about all. But when you first came together, <clears throat> we were surprised to find about 40 people coming together. And that included Ambed Gagupa as well and a Vietnamese as well. And then following that, we went for the Buddhist uh, interfaith, uh, interfaith service. There were 75 of us. And then that's the encouragement that we got together. And then we decided to uh, form an association when I was in with the founding coordinator. And uh, now behind all this, of course, was Dr. John, John Bertrand, this Christian Dialogues, and, uh, and continued later Boston Theological School. And he is now fully retired. And he's fully supportive of this our endeavor. I've talked to, I talked to him on Tuesday this morning, but for some technical reason, I can't, we can't seem to be communicating. Uh, so therefore, uh, he is not uh, available uh, today. Uh, however, he was, but before, since he's not available, however, I will, I, will, I will take time to 
before I come to the certificate, I, will, I want to, uh, to uh, uh, read you a column I read on, uh, in 1995. In fact, 21 year, 26 years ago to date. Uh, this is a piece that appeared in the Toronto Star at that time. I was writing a column for the Toronto Star on the contemporary bioethical issues from a Buddhian point of view. And here's a column that I wrote. It, it was called, <coughs> let me see now. Uh, it was called, Let Us Help Christians Celebrate. And I read from the article itself, December 9th, I'm talking about crowing from the rooftops about the advent of Lord Jesus. And why am I talking so? Remember our school being caused to calling the seasonal event, uh, which was called Christmas event, Christmas concert, an international concert. Remember too, the funeral about lighting up government buildings because they offended some minority practicing Christians bending over backward for them. Mind you, this appeared in the Toronto Star. They were offended at the majority community celebrating their event, while minorities exult about, about theirs from rooftops. But folks, it's a matter of history as well. French or English, this nation was founded by Christians, let us not forget. Our institutions, democracy, parliament, the legal system, is what opened the window to celebrate our own festivals that are very Christian related too now. Gratitude would also encourage us to remember that it was a Christian who allowed us, or to be more gracious, invited us non-Christians, I'm talking about the immigrants community, of course, uh, to, become to, the, to come to this land. And was it a Catholic, former Prime Minister Trudeau, who gave us our multiculturalism? Christians are people, as you know, uh, Christians are people too, you know, with no less religious commitment, no less yearning for human happiness, and looking for spiritual liberation. So let's return their celebration to them this festive season. I'm inspired to do the best I can by mudita altruistic joy. It is me that their happiness is my happiness as well. You know it too. You practice it all the time in relation to family and friends. English or French, mainstream or multi-stream, may I then invite you to put aside our differences just for the season and join me and our Christian sisters and brothers in serenading the birth of Jesus the Christ as we also pinch ourselves lightheartedly. I, this is something I also read over the uh, Vision TV. Uh, and then, so I now invite you to join me later in your own way, not to the mic, uh, with the, this in the uh, Christmas carol, uh, ending it, fa la 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 that's the carol. <laughs> now, so okay, join me. So I'm going to read it and then, um, uh, here the last ones here. Deck the buildings with boughs of holly, fa la 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 la. Stem the light of multicultural folly, fa da 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 da. Born the nation of Christianity, fa la 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 la. Like you are this stubborn country, fa la 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 da 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 da. Light your candles for the Wali Hanukkah, fa la 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 la. Night and day pray, pray, pray to Allah. Oh, la 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 la. And the Buddha is the timeless. timeless la 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 la. There's no reason to steal Lord Jesus. La 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 la. Come, me idle lads and lasses. La 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 la. Clean up your clothes, glasses. La 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 la. Can you see your Christian feet? La 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 la. Born to make you feel some healing. La 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 la. This is the season to build community. La 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 la. Kiss goodbye to our insecurity. La 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 la. Let's join hands Let's in good spirituality. I am the chariot of love to humanity. And this is something I also read on TV and TV. And so because uh, in order to represent now, this can be seen as representing the absence of uh, Professor John Bertram 
and we thank you for joining me. So thank you joining, for joining. Uh, it's about actually excellent timing, 5.02 now, exact timing. And thank you, honorees, President Abson. Uh, you are among the pioneers who has helped us keep Canadian Buddhist flame alive, serving as inspiration for future generations as well. May we are unhappy and live long, but with the ultimate goal of Nibbana always in mind. Uh, blessings to the Triple Gem, uh, Metta, and hope you all presenters and registrants have also enjoyed the afternoon. Uh, see you tomorrow then. Have a good evening and rest for sleep. May we learn happy Metta. Sadhu. 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 Thank you, everybody.